Okay, so we have the script manager complete now with code. So in this video, we will upload the script manager code and the uh, script definitions and fragments uh, attached in the descriptions below. Uh, but I thought I'd walk through a little bit of it here and then um, I'll jump into the editor and we'll look at sort of configuring some different scenarios uh, and when you might use the script manager versus the behavior tree. So before we do that, um, we needed a couple of animations just to sort of test out some different scenarios. And there is a, a free pack, the mocap basics, which is in the permanently free section of the marketplace. And from that, we pulled uh, two conversational animations, one for someone listening, nodding their head along, and the other one for speaking and moving their arms a little bit. So you'll be seeing in the video, we're using those two assets. Uh, you can go ahead and get those assets yourself directly out of the uh, marketplace. Uh, but that's just heads up. All right, so let's talk a little bit about the high level structure of the script manager and how that uh, is seen both in game and in the editor. So attached to the AI pawn is our script manager component, which is very similar to the Lyra inventory manager component in that it is the component attached to the actor that is in the world and it processes the information and performs the activities necessary. The script manager has a script description file, which is a data asset, um, not dissimilar from an item definition file. And that uh, script description file has a series of script fragments, uh, which are U objects and those script fragments would be similar to the item uh, fragments in the inventory system. And so those should be very familiar. Um, when you open up the plugin, you'll see the scripts folder. We have our AI script description for conversation, A and B, uh, script to move to certain places in the map, script to do animated uh, random animations and then a tester that just lumps all of those together and does a bunch of different random elements just to test each of the fragments. Out. Um, so that's the high level structure on the fragment that is all sort of per AI pawn basis. So an AI will get a script manager. That script manager will get one script definition and you can, uh, and it'll run through that script. Inside the script definition, um, you have a frequency, which allows you for performance reasons to turn down the frequency. So maybe you only want this script to evaluate every half a second, one second, every two seconds. Um, this is fundamentally the timer interval. So nothing will happen in between one seconds, regardless of what I set for the various fragments. Then the fragments are processed in sequence. Um, so whatever fragment you put in the first index, uh, the script manager will wait until three seconds have elapsed, and then it'll execute this move to relative location, and it'll move the pawn to this location here. And then it'll wait uh, until seven seconds, and then it'll move to this location, and it'll just keep chaining its way down through the script definition, executing various fragments. Finally, at the end, if you want to have something wait for a half an hour before doing the script again, uh, you can put a wait at the bottom and loop the script. So that it'll execute through the script. It'll wait here for the defined amount of time and then it'll loop back up and continue it and do the process. So that allows you to either have a looping script or a non-looping script, simply changing this. It allows you to put these wait nodes um, either at the bottom or interdispersed between if you need to. Um, and then you'll see the different fragments that we've got set up in a moment as a starter kit. On the spawner side, um, so we have our spawner and the spawner configuration, which is a data table, that's these here, will allow you to set up multiple pawns for a spawner. So a spawner might have three pawns or five pawns or seven pawns. And each individual pawn can either use a behavior tree. So here is a uh, example of a behavior tree setup, or it might use a script. So these here are the uh, script descriptions here. 
here and here. So you can see that you, you could have multiple pawns that mix and match. Some might use a behavior tree, some might use a script. It's really up to you for whatever you need. But those are basically the high level structures. And then in the spawner, which is what this is here in the world, you basically have the same things we've talked about, whether or not we're using the object cooler, what our class and controller are, what's our radius. And then here is our, um, our AI logic, right? So in this case, we've got the script configuration using the scripting, the scriptures, the scriptive language, and uh, this is a conversation. So you'll, you'll, if you were to open this, you would see multiple pawns being referenced inside this, uh, this file. If you look at the classes, um, they're pretty uh, self-explanatory. So we have our pawn and pawn controller. We have our script definition, our script fragment, then the children of that being the animation, play audio, move to a location, follow a path, wait, or randomly wander. Those are the ones we've coded so far. We have our script manager, our spawner, and our spawner subsystem, which is our object pool. In this video, we're adding a new element to allow you to do interactions. And so there's a new section that has been added into the spawner configuration that says for this particular uh, pawn, uh, I want to enable interaction. And when you click on it, I want to bring up the storage window. So this is just using very similar to the Lyra world collectible logic um, to enable or disable uh, interaction on any one of the um, pawns. I only referenced this here because it's important and I didn't want to lose sight of it. One of the things that we discovered is that our interact logic and our spawn trigger logic were conflicting with each other. Uh, so if you end up in a scenario where you're trying to interact with something and it's not interacting, um, it is likely because you were inside a spawner's uh, trigger radius and that's consuming the, uh, the line trace. And so what basically this, you can read all this yourself, but basically what it means is that because we're using the trigger definition uh, right here, the trigger definition, that we needed to go in and create a new channel called the range check. So we just created this new channel using channel six, and you just copy and paste that into your game I and I, that's perfectly fine. And then on the Lyra Pond capsule, also in the uh, game engine I and I file, we had to add here that the range check would overlap. So what we're basically saying with these minor adjustments is the range check should be ignored for all things except when the Lyra Pond capsule uh, overrides with the range check. So that's our check to spawn our spawner. So you need to make these changes. You can read these comments. Um, it shouldn't be that difficult, but basically that's in the code just to capture that so that if you do run in that situation, you can look at this compared to your config file um, and make any changes necessary. All right, so there's a couple of outstanding items. Um, we wanted to push this out even though we haven't finished the optimization, we'll continue to do that in future releases. You'll just get the get the performance improvements, right? So right now, fragments are being spawned as U objects um, in order to process using the uh, virtual functions. You can't have a static function and a virtual function, and so it's requiring us to spawn U objects for fragments. Uh, we're going to look at possibly moving that into the object pooler to save some performance on spawning those and interacting with those. Uh, there's an odd bug in Interact, which uh, we're in the middle of tracking down. I will show it to you in the video. Uh, and then we have to add nameplates, damage, and abilities to round out the end of this series. So without further ado, let's jump into the editor and, uh, and see it in action. OK, so here's our test map. And uh, you can see I've got lots of spawners all over the map. Um, in fact, I've got plenty of these, but what we're going to do is I'm going to disable 
at least those. Uh, and disable those. And that leaves us with two name two. That'll leave us with these spawners. And I don't want this one either. Let's get rid of that one. That's a duplicate. Number seven. And let's look at number eight. Uh, eight is a duplicate as well. So I'm guessing that seven and eight are duplicates. All right, we'll right, turn those off. So now we have the six spawners that are kind of around this area um, that should spawn in over here by the tree, these couple across here, probably these two or three over here. So let's go ahead and launch in. Okay, so we've got a couple of AIs that are running, and I'll just go to each of them. So this one is using a behavior tree, and it is simply moving from one end to the other of a very short spline. So they're moving out and back into one spline. Oh, i got to continue to enhance that length of that thing. Where are you? All right, there's our guys walking. This one is using a script, and they're simply moving through a series of animations randomly. So every couple of seconds, it's going to pick another random script, uh, animation and rotate through it. Very simple. These guys are running a little more complexity. These guys are doing the same thing over there. These are our interactable three. Now, I'll show you the bug. Um, if I trace interact which I should have probably turned the debug on. I'm not getting the, uh, the interact. However, as soon as I interact with these, you see how the interact shows up and come back, you'll see the interact now shows up. So there's a small bug there that I haven't figured out what to replicate from the uh, Lyra world collectible. Uh, but nonetheless, once I hover over a Lyra world collectible, everything seems to be fine and I can interact and basically bring up the uh, inventory storage as if that was a bank and as if that was a, uh, a crafting station. So those are the three that have interactable set on it. Uh, those are running that script. There's another guy running here in a pattern. You'll see him run a pattern. He's just moving in a circle and then he's gonna stop and then he'll, he'll run uh, in this direction. And what you'll notice, see the green, he won't quite make the green dot and he'll change to the next one. So you see that he moved to the next one. So you can actually have him, by changing the distance, not make it to the destination and just change angles. So this guy's running a circle pattern. And then I've got a audio cue, which I think what I'll do is stop and restart. So we'll stop that. Oh, I'm also muted. Okay. Every day there seems to be another group of these creatures. Agreed. I just took care of them yesterday, and now they are back. We might as well take care of this ourselves. No one is going to do it for us. Right behind you. So I'll show you this script. Right, so they basically have a little interaction and then they both head off in a direction to form a quest or do something. All right, so let's look at, uh, let's look at that conversational script. So there are two scripts, A and B, which is Quinn and Manny. And there's a conversation data table. So conversation data table has Quinn spawning at a particular location using the very simple uh, AI blueprint class, not interactable, no collision, no sphere, has a controller, no behavior tree, is running a script and is running the conversation A script. 
This one, exactly the same, except it's Manny, and Manny's running conversation B. So if I look at A, what you'll see is um, I'm ticking every quarter of a second in this conversation. My script starts with an animation, and that animation is speaking, and then I play this um, audio cue. Now, you could put the audio cue in the anim montage. Um, the only reason I was doing it this way is, is two reasons. One, I wanted to test the simultaneous launch of a animation and audio track, so they're both set to the same time index. And I want to reuse this uh, throughout the script. So when Manny is speaking, um, Quinn is listening. So at zero, zero, Quinn is listening. Manny is speaking. This is his dialogue. And then you move on. And at 3.84 seconds into it, Manny starts listening. And Quinn starts speaking. So at 3.84, Quinn starts speaking. And it goes back and forth through the dialogue. Animation, audio, animation, etc. There is one more animation at the end, which is uh, stop prior montage. So in this case, where you might have a looping montage, the if I switch from one montage to the next, it will interrupt the loop and launch the next one. But if you don't stop it at the end of the script, uh, it'll just keep looping. And so this uh, animation fragment allows us to use a stop prior animation flag. You don't have to give it any uh, any montage information. You just give it that flag, and it'll stop any animations at that point. And then step seven in this is to basically follow the path. So they will follow path A. And he will follow path B. So you go back to this particular spawner. That is not the spawner. Uh, it is there. Right here. So the spawner has four paths. Path A is this one right here. And it runs this distance to the tree. Path B is this one. And it runs to the tree using that. Now these splines... Um, you can, so now I've got C. So I can make C start here, grab this point, hold Alt, drag, curve, and basically make path C do something totally different and then sign the script to say someone needs to follow that path. So if you remember the ones on the behavior tree here, these ones, which are running the behavior tree test, we're simply running to the end and back of, of this line. So if I made this one longer, when we come back in, you'll see that they won't be running in the same pattern as they were before. And then this, I believe, was our move to Yes, he's doing a move to location. And so the move to location is a script. So there's no behavior tree. It's simply a script, which is called move to places. And has a series of fragments and has a set position. Now, the easiest way to do that, so let me close these down, is we created a helper on the spawner. So let's say I've got... Uh, let's go ahead and copy this one. So we've copied the third index out of the script. We're going to go back to the spawner. And we have a not advanced. A move to location helper. So if I paste that value into that location, you will see it on the map. 
not oh, right here. So we have this widget that is the move, move to location helper for that spawner. And that is this right here. And if I were to move this, you'll see that, uh, how do I make you see that? Didn't lock that up. As you move the helper, the location on the, just lift it up and push it down. The location will move based on that. So when you get the helper in the position you want, you basically copy that and then paste it into your uh, sequence. So just paste it here. And then, so if I wasn't happy with where the fourth position was, I could copy that position, paste it in here, which is right here. And then maybe I want to move that fourth position to sort of right here. Copy that, go back in here, make that the fourth position. And then the times is how long it should take to get to each of those points. So if you remember, he started going towards the first location, didn't quite get there, converted to the second location. So what I might do is increase the time, allow him more time to get closer to that location. So that's playing around with the move to places, simply doing a loop around the map. Um, we showed the, oh, so the, these guys are pretty simple. These are our crafters. So if we open up the crafter, you'll see I have three pawns being spawned off that spawner. Uh, they do nothing at all. They have no controller. They have no movement. The only thing they have is the interaction set up for each of them. So each has their own interaction window that clicks when you, when you open those up. Uh, this guy was set up uh, with some animations. So here he is also, I believe, running a script. Yes, running this random script. And that random script is basically at five seconds going to pick from a random set of montages. And those montages all have different probability weights from zero to one. And it will process them sequentially until it succeeds. And so I recommend that if you're gonna use the random montage, have one with 1.0 at the very bottom so that you always pick someone. So if this were to trigger, let's say I had this to one, then it would never pick anyone else because this would always be successful. So if we keep that down at about two, that means one fifth of the time this will get picked. And then if that doesn't happen, then this will fire. If that doesn't happen, this will fire. If that doesn't happen, then this will fire. And 100% of the time it will play this montage. So it's simply just picking through those, those four M's um, and playing those. And so if I, in that. Let's launch again. I'm going to just float, float out. So you see the audio? We might as well take care of this ourselves. Fades away to nothing, so it's, it's range based. And then the green debug is the guy moving in the circle. So you saw he had a green debug. The yellow is the, or the white is the path following. So here, audio is purple. So when they're speaking, it's showing the audio in purple. We might as well take care of this ourselves. No one is going to do it for us. Right behind you. And then the white will be the path following. So when they're path following, you'll see the white. Not sure why they're going backwards, but that's okay. Oh, it was set at the wrong end. So they're path following with white. This one's path following with white. Path following through the behavior tree, and the green is the move to location. It's just little different things to help debug what people are doing. So you see over there that one's doing the green dot, and he's moving around. 
All right, so hopefully uh, that's helped for some folks. We'll continue to advance and debug. Um, basically, I just noticed there's a behavior tree error on screen, but uh, it's more or less working at this point. It's good enough to get out there in people's hands, and then we'll continue to enhance it. All right, thanks for watching.